Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you again. Second week. We've been talking about perception, how we perceive the world through our five senses. I want to review what we talked about last week and then take it in a new direction. So here we go. Let's have some fun with this. Perception, how we perceive the world and why it matters. And uh, I wrote the presentation and my friend David did the PowerPoint and I'm going to talk him up as much as I can because this PowerPoint is really fantastic. All right, let's do some review. Last week, the definition of perception, the ability to receive information or data about something from the senses and form a mental impression of that thing. So when I say perception, I'm talking about what comes to us through our five senses. Sight, smell, touch, taste, and what am I missing? Hearing. Hearing. Thank you. Sight, hearing, smell, taste, type, touch. Okay, so the first question I asked is, and I had a bowl of uh, corn chips up here, <laughs> do we perceive all features of an object? Obviously the answer is no. There's a lot going on that we cannot perceive with our five senses. Ultraviolet light, infrared light, x-ray, microwave, radio waves, magnetic fields, those are all things that we cannot perceive. So the answer to that first one is no. Is what we perceive objective? At least if we look at something, is this the way it really looks? Is this what it really is? What does an object really look like? Do we perceive reality as it really is? Those are all questions that orbit around the same, same idea. I started out by talking how animals perceive the world. We talked about how dog has a super duper sense of hearing, but not as good eyesight as us. Talked about how bat use sonar and can fly at 50 miles an hour, bounce a sound wave that they produce off of an object, receive the, um, the echo of that object back into their brain, and while they're flying as fast as we drive, they get a mental image of what that thing is and know whether to eat it or avoid it. A bee. We talked about how bees can know if a, a uh, flower is pollinated by, by the charge, the electrical charge, positive or negative, that's left on the flower by the previous bee. We talked about a knife fish and how they emanate an electric field around their head that allows them to sense if anything comes in to range and again knows whether to avoid it or eat it. Talked about bacteria, how bacteria, even though they're a single cell organism, they can actually see, and it's not just sensing light, they actually have what we think is an unfocused image, image like we see. It's astounding. And then the octopus, which, again, if you ever believe that aliens have in in inhabited the Earth and, and brought an organism with them, it would be the octopus. If you know about computers and centralized memory and distributed networks, that's the way an octopus is. It looks, it appears that their whole, it's, instead of a, having a brain up here, their whole body seems to be responsible for how they perceive the world. So they're built completely different. Where does our perception come from? And this is one of the first things that I said that may be a little shocking to some people. I made the case, we were talking about we had a red rose up here. Is the rose red? How do we know it's red? Where does its redness come from? Made the case that our brain, if you look at the right hand side, we have the optic nerve, the, the eyeball, and the optic nerve that goes to the brain. Well, the redness is not in the, um, in the, in the waves coming from the object to the optic nerve, that's just physics. It's not in the signal from the eye to the brain, that's just chemistry. Where does that vivid color that we perceive come from? And the answer is, our mind manufactures that. That vivid color that we see is our brain interpreting 
those light waves and the electrochemical signal from the eye. Shocking when you really start to think about it. Okay, can, if, if those first two are no, then can we at least say that what we see is consistent? Do I see the same red that my friend Tim sees? Do we perceive the redness the same? The answer is there is simply no way to know. I used the analogy last time. I said we can't do a screen share, my brain to his, or a Vulcan mind meld from Star Trek. There's no technology available, and we can't even imagine how there could be technology available that would allow me to know if what he perceives, or any of you, is identical to what I perceive. Again, it's kind of shocking. We talked about uh, synesthesia, which is a condition where people, when they see a particular number, for example, like the number, the number two, they will always see it in yellow. And it's consistent for them. It's not a random thing. That's just how they perceive the world. And synesthesia is not seen as a problem or a defect. It's just the way some of us are, wi are, are wired. So my point is that we cannot know that we each perceive the world the same. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. I'm going backwards. Here's a guy who... We talked about blind sight, which is a condition where people, some people who are completely blind, there is no signal going from the eyeball to the brain, and yet they can somehow know when object, where objects are in front of them. And they don't even know how they know it but they can walk around those things as if they can see them. So somehow that signal is getting, getting to the brain. Is what we perceive useful? Well, clearly it's useful. I mean, we can see the world. We know not to, I know not to step off this step. I, I can smell the food and know whether to eat it or not. I know from talking to people, whether they're friend or foe, God has, God has given us a world, even though we don't see it as it really is, it is entirely useful. It is functional. We don't kill ourselves because we don't see it realistically. So, I came to this slide. I love this slide. It's one of my favorite ones. Like, so what? Okay, these are interesting, cool little facts. What do we do with them? Well, from a Christian standpoint, I think that if, if I can't know that what you perceive is what I perceive, I need to be a lot more patient with you than I want to be. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Really understanding that your perception of the world may be entirely different. Why do you like this kind of movie? Why do I like this, this kind of art? That kind of thing. Another one that ties into that is humility. My way of seeing the world, first of all, none of us see it as it really is, and my way of seeing it isn't any better or more accurate than your way of seeing it. I use this example also for we, the fact that what we see is so glorious and so amazing. And it's not just what we see, it's what we hear. It's how we taste. It's all the sensual input that God has given us that goes into our mind that from an evolutionary standpoint is pretty unnecessary. And even if God, all he wanted us to do was just eat and survive and even have relationships, he didn't need to give us this amazing technicolor 3D high-resolution view of the world that, that, that we have. So I, I use these slides as an example. This is a, just a beautiful mountainscape that David found. But this is how the world could have looked to us. It could have looked just out of focus all the time. It could have looked really stark. Okay? We, could we still eat and enjoy our food? Could we still 
love God? Could we still function in the world if the world looked like this? Yes. But for some reason, it's really important to God that he gives us this incredible view. The world could have looked like this, just black and, black and white and gray. Or it could have looked like this, just black and white, right? We could still get along. What if it looked like that? Just green and yellow. What if it was just dark all the time? What if our vision just wasn't that good and it looked like twilight all the time? Or what if all we saw was one color? A lot of animals only have one color receptor. So this is similar to what they see. If we only had a blue receptive receptor, this is what we would see. But this isn't what we see. We see this, this amazing view. So part of my point today, and we're going to go into it further, is, and this has actually made a difference to me when I, when I've, as I go about my day, when I wake up and I open my eyes, this glorious, amazing, beautiful, sensual view of the world that is completely unnecessary for any reason that I can think of other than God wants us to have this beautiful, amazing, sensual view of the world. So that, what are we to do with that? Gratitude all the time. You think of sometimes, what has God done for me today or even lately? Well, what if the world looked like one of those slides back there? This is every day, all the time, moment to moment. This is what we get. We get this amazing view. We, get, we don't just get sounds in our ear. You think about it. It's just sound waves bouncing off of coming to our ear. It's our brain that interprets that as speech or music or a sound that we need to, explosion that we need to, to run away from that, is, that may be dangerous to us. Okay? Taste. Sometimes the most enjoyable thing we do all day is eat. Eating is not just sustenance. It's social. It's, it's spiritual. <laughs> it's like a good piece of art. That's why famous chefs are rich, you know? or they should be. <laughs> because the food, it's, it's such an enjoyable thing to do, is to eat. Thank God for that. OK, so I want to go, last week we talked about perception, just the input from our senses. This week I want to talk about the bigger picture, and that is, I, I'm calling it our sound and light show that every one of us has that we carry around with us all day long. Again, it's this, high co this full color, high resolution, 3D, what movies have been trying to do for 100 years is get to that point of this that we have with us all day long. And the questions I want to ask is, what does this say about God? And how are we supposed to think about it? And I'm going to ask the same question again. Do we all have similar experiences of the world? We're already given, it's already given that um, we have different perception. But overall, is our view of the world pretty much similar? I want to, I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to show you 12 different slides, OK, of different kinds of things. And I'll describe each one, and then I'm going to go and put all 12 up on the screen at the same time. And what I want you, each of you to do is just say in your head, that, that's interesting to me, or, it's, or I don't care about that. OK? And then I'm going to ask just kind of a quick poll. So the very first one, a map. OK? The next one, math formula. Next one. An animal picture. Next one, a beautiful, another beautiful scene that David found online, nature scene. Next one, architecture. A, a, a maybe you think so and maybe you don't, beautiful building. Photograph. Portrait. Picture of some 
traditional, traditional art. Modern art. Cartoon. I remember this guy. Classic automobile. A mechanical device. Look at the intricacy of that stuff in there. And then a picture of a child. Okay, so here's all 12 of them. Somebody tell me what, what, what interested you out of those 12? Just shout it out. Car. Car. <laughs> the map. The map. Nature scene. Nature scene. Mountains. Typewriter. The typewriter, good. Good. I'll tell you what, what interests me. The map, the math formula, and, the, and the, the mechanical device. I wanted something really mechanical. When I was a kid, I would stare at mechanical things like they were hypnotic because I wanted to understand how they worked. And I can, my wife will attest to this, she'll say, we're on vacation, honey, can you plan our route out for tomorrow? Oh, yeah, I can do that, get the map out. I'll be back in three hours, right, because I just love maps. There's something about maps that are just fascinating to me. Some of that stuff, I don't care nearly as much about the animal pictures as my wife does. But my point here is that each one of us are automatically drawn to different th things than each other. I used to go to Disneyland when I went to Disneyland or Magic Mountain. You know, here's Disneyland, Main Street, and all the characters, and the castle, and all the people, and it's just beautiful, and everybody's taking pictures. And, and what I'm doing is, I get on the ride, and I want to see how it works. I want to see how the roller doesn't fall off the track, and how this piston thing pushes the car up. That's that's why I go to Disneyland. I want to know how it works. So we're all drawn to different things, aren't we? We all take this room in. Each one of us may concentrate on a different, on a different thing, just because the way our brains are built, the natural interest that God has given each one of us. I want to make the case, and I'm going to keep going here, but our conscious experience is unique to each one of us. Not only are we perceiving different things, we pay attention to different things. And I made the case last week that our mind is a black box. I feel, I think evidence tells us that our mind, this sound and light show that, that, that we have that we call consciousness, is not explainable entirely by material, materialistic terms. I don't think scientists will ever find a purely physical, material way of explaining consciousness. There is a spiritual, non-material component to, to our minds. And I think the evidence comes, from, a lot of good evidence comes from near-death experiences where people leave their bodies, they perceive something that is real to the world, that they couldn't have seen even if they were awake on the operating table. They remember the experience, which means part of our memory is not in our physical brain. They come back into their body. They relay the story to someone, a doctor or a nurse who's not particularly a believer one way or another. And there that thing is, they really saw it. They really saw it. So the biblical idea that we are, there's a sort of a dualist outlook that we are both body and spirit seems to be true. And if there's, in the same way there's physical laws for the physical universe, maybe there's spiritual laws for the spiritual universe. You know, there's way things work, but we have no access to any of that. We don't know how that works. So this, the, the, the sensory input that I get from my body, my, my eyes, my ears, the taste, it goes into my mind. My mind is not material. I can, there's no way to know that I'm processing that stuff the same way any of you process it. Then we are all paying attention to different kinds of things. 
So that confuses it even more. People given, here's another thing I want to say, people, and all of this explains partly, people given the same facts come to, can come to very different conclusions. I read an article last night about statisticians who you would think, these guys deal in numbers. And they did a study where they, they had 70 different statisticians and gave them a set of data and, and said, we're asking this specific question about this specific set of data. And there literally were 70 different nuanced answers from that set of data. These are smart people, and they came to different conclusions. So let's assume for a minute the things that, we, that are hard to not assume, that we want to ascribe to other people, let's assume that they're not stupid, <laughs> they're not blind, they're not willfully ignorant, they're not careless, they just see it differently. What do we make of this? How do we explain all this? So here's some more reasons why we may see the world differently. We all have different life experiences. If we're raised by someone who's analytical and scientific, we may have a very rational, logical way of putting the facts together to draw, come to conclusions. If we're raised by somebody who's a, more artistic, we may come to conclusions based more emotionally. If you're raised in a country that's at war or a country that's at peace, you're going to have very different conclusions about the way the world works. Is one better than another? No. Sometimes being really analytical is better for some kinds of things. If you're a mathematician, being really analytical is going to be a benefit. If you're an artist, being really emotional and paying attention to that side of you is going to be a benefit. But day-to-day -day life, how we all reason, the fact that we come to different conclusions is the way that people are. And we need to accommodate that somehow and not try to ascribe motives to people that aren't there. Sometimes those motives are there. Sometimes people are willfully ignorant or sloppy or they don't care. But what I'm trying to say is that's not always the case. Here's, here's a fact that, is, that, when I, that I found really troubling when I first learned about it. There are a lot of psychologists, you know, they, they, they talk about different personality types. Some personality types, which is what you are born with, right? The personality type that you have is a big influence on which political party you're going to be a member of, or whether you generally are more conservative or more liberal. So it's easy for us to say, well, I'm a conservative, and, I, and here's all my reasons, and I have all my reasons in a row, and they're really rational, right? And somebody else says, well, I'm really liberal, and the same thing, they have all their reasons. But the truth of it is, a big component of why they're that way is simply the way their brain is built. And if that's not humbling, I don't know what is. That terrified me when I first learned that. I just wanted, didn't want to believe it, because I thought, if you think it through, you'll be one particular way, won't you? There's another way that we all think about things differently is physical differences. I'm 6'4". I see the world differently than somebody who is five foot. It's just the way it is. Not one is better or not one is worse, worse but physical differences make a big difference in how we perceive the world. The brain regions, the regions in the brain that are devoted to control and attention, in other words, what you pay attention to and how you think about it, vary between individuals even more than the sensory data inputs. So a lot of how we think and how we reason and how we come to decisions is, is just the way our brains are built. The way that God arranged, there may be two molecules right next to each other, 
that make you a genius because you can put a couple of ideas together that nobody else had. I want to show you a couple of uh, optical illusions. And these are really cool. And my point in these optical illusions is that not only are, is what we see very different from each other, but our brain doesn't always see things the way they really are. Our brain fills in facts in a way that is seamless and we can't really understand it. So I think I've got sound with this. Let's try this. This is a Charlie Chaplin mask. This is the hollow head. Actually, at the moment, it's a perfectly normal head of Charlotte Chaplin, but wait, as it comes round, you will see, or will you, that it's hollow. The back of it, coming round now, is actually a hollow mask. It appears to rotate in the opposite direction, and amazingly, the nose sticks out, although it's actually sticking in. Coming round now is the normal correct as it were face and wait again as it comes round and you'll see this extraordinary thing like Jekyll and Hyde both the noses stick out because it's so unlikely that a nose sticks in that a face is hollow so you see it as convex although it's in fact concave as now and then it will become the normal face again there and note that as soon as the features appear in the hollow inside, it will look convex as though it's a normal face almost, though it isn't. As soon as the features appear, there, your brain refuses to see it as hollow simply because it is so unlikely. And this demonstrates the immense power of top-down knowledge which will actually counter signals bottom up from the senses and force an extraordinary illusion in which the sensory information of the present is cancelled by immense knowledge derived from the past because you've seen so many faces all with their noses sticking out so it's just impossible to see that as correctly hollow This is the hollow head. Actually, at the moment, it's perfectly normal. Okay, so you saw what happened there. I've seen this thing probably a dozen and a half times, and every time I watch it, I think, okay, I'm really going to focus, <laughs> and I'm going to see it for what it really is as I'm looking at the nose, and as the nose goes past, but within, you know, a quarter of a second, my brain s changes what's really going on to... It, it wants to see it as a, as a face with the nose sticking out and all of a sudden even though it's going in the wrong direction and you know it's going in the wrong direction I cannot maybe some of you can and maybe that's part of the difference that we have but I cannot track it the way it's really happening and every time it comes to the end and then it looks like it switches around and you go what happened it's it, so it's our mind telling us what we're seeing not taking in what we're actually seeing. It's phenomenal. Okay, here's another one. All right, ready for this? This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Okay, you ready? How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15, 15 passes. passes, but... But did you see the gorilla? Watch.
This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. All right, now be honest. How many people didn't see the gorilla? First time I saw it, I didn't. Right? Yeah, first time I saw it, I didn't see it. Really? So you were, it's, it's about 50-50, they say, of people that watch this that are so busy counting the passes that this guy in a gorilla suit, full size, just walks through and beats his chest and walks off and you don't even see it. Pretty amazing. That's how our mind can focus on what we think we're supposed to be paying attention to and completely miss this other thing that's going on actually was slower than passing the balls, wasn't it? He didn't try to stay out of the way, he didn't try to hide. We aren't wired or built to see things as they really are. Our mind seamlessly fills in a lot of gaps, and how and to what extent we do that varies widely from person to person. Another example of how we see things, perceive things differently. I've got a I've got this really interesting paper here by a, 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 a philosopher named Thomas Nagel. It's called, What is it like to be a bat? It's only 17 pages, it's really brilliant, and he makes the case, he says, for human beings and for most of the higher animals, there must be something it is like to be that thing. So what is it like to be my dog? What is it like to be a bat? We can't say that about inanimate things, right? It, what it, and what he's, the point he's making is there is a very subjective side to consciousness that we really can't quantify. And he makes a really good, interesting point. He says, you know, let's go back to the bats. The bats use sonar as their main way of navigating the world. What does that look like in their mind? They sleep upside down. They only come out at dawn and dusk because that's when their vision is best. In the daylight and at night, they don't see really well. They eat bugs all day long. And his question, when he said this, really, I mean, what is it like to be a bat? We can't imagine it. But then he said, I'm not asking, what is it like for a human being to be a bat? We could sort of imagine that. He's saying, what's it like for a bat to be a bat? All bets are off, aren't they? We can't even imagine what their conscious experience is like, what their sound and light show is like. So, he, I, I came up with a question that's sort of in line with where I'm going after reading that paper. I thought, if I, I can't imagine what it's like for a bat to be a bat, can I imagine what it's like for Tim to be Tim? He's a human being, so there's going to be a lot more commonality. But he's got, and each one of you, have a way of looking at the world and specific experiences and the way that we perceive the world and physical characteristics that, that mean that I can't really imagine that, can I? I imagine he probably has a visual field like I do with colors, and what do those colors look like to him? I can't know that. Wh what is his field of vision? I, I don't know those things. What does, he, what does he hear when he hears Beethoven's sonata? Does he love classical music or he hates it? Even if he says he loves it and I love it, are we hearing the same thing in the same way? This makes it there, there is such humility in this for me. I just can't know what each of you, what your, what your experience is like. And where I want to go with this is not some kind of, well, well, let's just give up getting to know each other. It's exactly the opposite. What does it take to really get to know somebody? It just takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of concern. It takes a lot of effort and care and love. And that's where we're going to go with the rest of the talk. So, I thought I'd be a little vulnerable here. What's it like to be Ross? 
I tried to write down some features that I know are true of myself, both good and bad, that might give you an idea of what the world looks like through my brain. Okay, I'm 6'4". I love being tall. I'm left-handed. It's kind of a point of pride, to be honest. It's kind of cool, even though I'm more likely to cut my hand off with a power saw because all the tools are made for right-handed people. I shake. My hands have always shook since I was a teenager. It's just part of who I am. I don't even notice it anymore. I'm generally healthy. My body works still really well. I have the ability to hyper-focus on things. When I was a kid, I would, I, I, I'd see some mechanical thing. I remember what it was, too. You know those old um, lawn chairs that sit around the, the, uh, the pool, and they'd have a, a, a foot rest that you can, you can move it up, and it clicks, and up, and it clicks, and up, and it clicks, and up, and it clicks. And if you go high enough, then it releases it, and it goes all the way back down, right? I had to figure out how that worked. And I could lay in bed at night as a kid and just picture that, right? How would that work? Okay, you need this little gear here and this ratchet, and then this releases when it gets all the way up there. And I could focus on that until I figured it out. It might take me a few nights or even a few months, but I could just hyper-focus on stuff, and I still, I still generally can do that. I can get angry really fast, faster than I can understand it or even see it coming. I'm really people focused. I love people. I love being around people. I'm super social. I can disconnect really easily. When I'm talking to someone, if I'm tired or there's something else going on, my, I have to be really careful to pull my brain back to the conversation. I'm, I need constant stimulus. I'm not the kind of person that just sits and rests easily. I've usually got six or eight or ten things going on in my head, ideas both for my work or for, for talking here or, or whatever's going on. I like having a whole bunch of trains of thought going through my head at the same time. It's really hard for me to slow down. My wife will say, let's take the day off today or let's take some time. And I have to physically like, take a deep breath and convince myself that this is a good idea. It's, it doesn't come easily. I worry a lot. I feel guilty about stuff often. Um, I'm constantly aware of social cues to the point where it's debilitating sometimes. I'm always thinking about what other people are thinking. And I'm always looking at them to see if they're approving or disapproving or, or off somewhere else. I'm really, I'm really a very emotional person. I'm always feeling something, and I'm pretty aware of what I'm feeling. I'm also extremely analytical. Like I said, I, can, I, can, I, can, I try to analyze mechanical things, electrical things, even philosophical things. To me, that's all the same kind of, of, of thing. I'm trying to break it down. What's the fundamentals of that thing? That really fascinates me. I tend to be very forgiving. I can be very forgetful. I have to make lists. I have to keep track of things. And I think more than most people seem to have to do. I can't visually see things in a jumble. If that table there was covered with stuff, like tools at my job site, right, and I want to find that particular screwdriver, my, my mind, my eyes won't just see it. I have to go over there and look in each section to find it. So there's a visual thing that I got to do. I'm probably OCD. I know I used to struggle. I, I know I'm OCD. I used to struggle with that, and I'm probably ADD. Are you trying to tell me something, Jamie? I'm just wondering if you do like I do, you shop with your hands. Shop? Yeah, when you shop, you have to touch everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, it's very tactile. So. So what's it like to be me? Well, that's what it's like to be me, a little bit, okay? I imagine if each one of you sat down, it took me about a half an hour to write that stuff down, each one of us would have an entirely different list of what it's like to be Tim or Jeremy or Susan.
But those are the kind of things we need to get to know about each other if we're going to love somebody and care about them and try to understand them and be able to talk to them. How do you think about things? How do you come to conclusions? Boy, it's tedious. It's hard work. But it's really rewarding when we do that. The next slide I want to go to is a little bit different, but I'm picking up on what we talked about last week about, about why we see the world the way we see it in this full color view that God has given us. I, why are we so moved by beauty? Now, beauty implies a couple of different things, doesn't it? Number one, that things are beautiful. And number two, that beauty is a thing. I don't think animals see beauty the way we see beauty. We look at those 12 pictures we saw, and each one of you has different ones that you liked or didn't care about. And in that sense, beauty is very subjective. But every one of us finds something beautiful. So beauty in that sense, is objective. Why did God, why was God so concerned with giving us a, wor a world that's beautiful and a world that we each perceive differently as beautiful? Why is beauty such a thing? Why is it even a category? That's where I want to try to go. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. I think God has given us beauty as a foretaste for heaven, as a foretaste for what he's going to look like. Is think of the most beautiful thing you can think of, the, the thing that gives you, that just makes you happy to be alive, that song that you remember, or the view from the trail that you love to go to, or the building you love to look at, or whatever it is for you. Whatever that is for you, God himself is going to be infinitely many times more beautiful than that. And what we're doing here is setting up for being able to relate to him, to be able to see him. In the varied and in, in different ways that we all see the world, we all see beauty. And I want to say too, I, I meant to say this before, <laughs> in trying to get to know each other and trying to know what it's like to be Ross, the person who's done that really well has been my wife. <laughs> She'll even say to me, how do you think about that? Or what does that mean to you when you do that? And that's a great question. I mean, it's very it's humbling to me, but it makes me feel like she really loves me because she's not just judging what I'm doing and thinking and saying, which I know can be really weird sometimes. She's trying to understand. That's what I think we got to do with each other. So my argument is really expanding on, my argument about perception is really expanding on this verse. It says, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived, and I could add, and in the manner in which we perceive it, is a testament to who he is and the world that he has given us. Again, the world could be what the world is, and we could perceive it in a really dull, flat, boring, uninteresting, unbeautiful way, but that's not what God has given us. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them, Genesis 1.27. I think the ability to see beautif beautiful things, to appreciate beauty, is part of our, our image of God that we, is built into each one of us. He is beautiful, and he wants us 
to be able to see that, to see it in each other, to see it in the world that he's given us. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So even the Bible is telling us about the beauty of the natural world, the beauty of a single flower, really, saying it's more beautiful than anything man can create. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. We appreciate those things because he made them. Now, it's really easy, isn't it, to worship the creation. A lot of people who don't believe in God, that's where their attention ends, isn't it? They'll spend, you know, a lot of money and a lot of time to go to Zanzibar or wherever and see or experience that one thing. And they deeply appreciate it and they're moved by beauty, but they don't take it the next step which is to be grateful to the beauty giver. And I tend, you know, I, the temptation is there for me. I can go out and have a really good time with friends and we're having a wonderful time and we're eating this great meal and I might have a beer and I might say, this is just, I'm, I feel, I never take that for granted. I'm always grateful that I live in a country and a place where we can do that. But sometimes I don't say, thank you Jesus for that experience because I know he gave it to me, and I know it may end at any time. We may not be able to do that. I love this next verse. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him, Psalm 34, 8. The reason I love this verse is it takes the, the perceptive ability that we have that gives us the most distance and range, which is sight, and the one that is the most intimate, which is taste, the one that, where, where the object has to actually be inside our body for us to sense it, and says, this is how God, this is how we are to experience God. And what I get from this is we're to experience him with the full range of our sensory ability, the full range of how we think about the world and how we take in this sound and light show. Every other thought we have, <laughs> should be, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this amazing experience that we have that we call, we call life. The other thing I think that we have to be really aware of when we're trying to relate to each other and we realize how, absolute, how absolutely different we may be from that other person is all the commands that God has given us to love. This is where we're supposed to be really careful. It's easy to, to oversee those verses. It's easy to think that our, our, our Christian walk should be about all this list of stuff that we're not supposed to do and make sure that we don't do those things and read the Bible and go to church and, and love our spouse. But what did Jesus say the most important commandment was? He could have answered that question in so many ways. You know, I don't want to freeze that moment in history. Jesus, the Pharisee, just asks that question. Jesus has a chance to answer. And running through his head, he's probably thinking, for the rest of time, people are going to know what I say to this question, and how am I going to answer it? He didn't say, follow the commandments. He didn't, there's a whole bunch of things he didn't say. He said, you want to sum it all up, condense it, know what, where my heart is, love. Love God, and then... One of the ways that we love God is by loving other people. How do I love that person if I have no idea if they even see the world the same way that I see them? Well, there's a really good verse for that, and I didn't have time to tell David to put these verses in, so I'm just going to read them. James 1.19, Know this, my brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. This should be in front of every political YouTube video you watch, right? What does the Bible say about love? 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. 
oh, wow, does it really say that? What if we really lived like that? That's what I think um, Eden was like. Every single person was looking out for the other person. And because of that, no one got overlooked. Romans 12.10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Reminds, you guys remember those old cartoons with Chip and Dale? You remember them? And they would all, ins they both insist, they were like the most polite cartoon characters ever. And one would hold the door and they'd say the ill one would say, no, I insist, let me hold the door. No, I insist, let me hold the door. I'll pay for the meal. No, I, I'll pay. You know, that's the way we're supposed to be. Ephesians 4.2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Again, politics. When you get involved in politics, you start thinking about things political. Everybody thinks about things differently. Some of that is absolutely le legitimate. We're to love those people. We're to pray for those people that we disagree with. And we're to try to get to know them and try to understand how they think. A lot of work. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. That's supposed to be the umbrella under which everything we do is done. Love. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now we're getting into the heavenly realms. What's another word for glory? There, there's so many words. There's its bigness, immensity, importance, shininess, but it's also beauty. Part of God's glory is his absolute stunning beauty. We won't get much done in heaven because we won't be able to take our eyes off of him. Be utterly fascinated. Isaiah 28, 5, in that day the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. Psalm 27, 4, one thing I have asked of the Lord that, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. We're going to have all kinds of fun stuff to do. I think heaven is going to be as complex a culture as we have here. We're not going to be bored. All of those stupid images that you see in popular culture where we, there's nothing to do. But the main thing we're going to be doing is, is gazing upon the most beautiful thing possible, which is the person of Christ, the person of God. One of my favorite authors is G.K. Chesterton, and I'm going to close with this quote again because closed with it last week, but it's such an amazing quote. Here dies another day during which I have had eyes, ears, hands, and the great world around me. And with tomorrow begins another. Why am I allowed to? That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I want to say thanks again to David. All those beautiful pictures that you can thank God for, David found those. On, on the internet, so um, he did a great job. Thanks again. So give David a hand for the PowerPoint. Okay. Any beautiful questions? <laughs> How much time do we have? We got like what, three minutes. Fifteen. Okay. I'm tired of talking. Okay, Tim. Tim. Yeah. Take. Dear friend. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a dear friend who uh, is missing one of the major senses. He has no sense of smell. Um, yeah. So when he was born, he had uh, terrible nosebleeds. And the, the, the question was, do you want to have nosebleeds for the rest of your life? Or we cauterize the inside of the nose, and you never be able to smell again. But you have no nosebleeds. And so his parents chose no nosebleeds. Wow. And since, since then, for his whole life, he's never been able to smell. And of course, as you guys know, taste affects smell drastically. So without smell, you only really have sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and, uh, and the last, umami, uh, or earthiness. Yeah. And, uh, and so I wonder, how does that affect missing some of these senses? How does that affect your experience 
Do you think it gets in the way of appreciating beauty? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, let's, take it to, let's take the condition to an extreme. Somebody like Helen Keller who was born blind and deaf. So how would you even explain to her what a rose looked like? How would your friend know what something smells like? I think, you know, there's, a, there's sort of a clinical way that I can answer that, which is my argument isn't necessarily for any one particular person. It's for the human race in general that we have this experience. But for him in particular, I'd say I know that with some people who have, who are missing or have a sense that is diminished, the others kind of pick up the slack. They, they sense other things. Some blind people have developed such a good sense of hearing that they can, they can tell that there's something in front of them because they can hear a little bit of an echo that we would, because our brains are taken over by the visual stimuli, we don't notice those clues. So, you know, the brain is like, I read this book once called The Mind and the Brain by Jeffrey Schwartz, and it was really great because he talked about how the brain works. And he likened it to, you know, those old telephone switchboards where you pull, the, the, the operators would pull one out and put another one in. And all of this different stimulus going into the brain is fighting for attention on the surface of the brain. That's why if you want to be a good piano player, you have to practice like two or three hours a day because as you practice, the brain realizes you're paying a whole lot of attention to that thing and it actually starts to physically rewire the brain. You get more neural connections on the brain related to piano playing. And if you stop piano playing, then those neural connections start going to other places regarding other things you're doing. And so it's the same way with our sensory input. If someone has no visual input at all, then the other sensory inputs are going to get enhanced and heightened. And even though that's a tragic thing, we live in a really busted up, broken world. And some of that stuff is just going to be like that. But, you know, another one of the things that I think is a sort of a promise from the near-death experiences, this is a really wild one. There are people who have had near-death experiences who are blind from birth and they see something in their near-death experience. What does that say? So the world to come is going to remedy all this stuff. It's going to right all these wrongs. We're going to see things and we think we see things vividly now. You know, the people who have near-death experiences often say the things they see, somehow it's enhanced. They see colors they didn't know existed. There's the lighting is different. It's, it's a different world. Does that answer, Tim? Yeah, Norm? Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, going back to the place where you have the blind person finding his way around the obstacles. Blind sight. Blind sight. And that, that um, reminds me just of what you're talking a little bit about here is that um, we don't recognize that he has any senses to see that obstacle. But we don't know, like you suggested, maybe it's sound waves bouncing off that object. And you're, they could either be sensed, sensed on your skin, for example, or your ears. Similarly, uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, so, so I, 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 thinking physically, you know, trying to see, uh, 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 it, it, seems to me, it seems to me that there's that, the, that the, there mu there's probably some kind of sense in that area that hasn't been, that we're not aware of, that hasn't been explored. Um, okay, that's, I guess that's what I have you to know, say. You know, it's very likely there's, there's some scientists who believe we don't have five senses, we have 53. Mm -hmm. And I'm not making that number up, that's actually what they say. You know, we talked about it last week, our sense of touch is a whole lot of different senses because we, we, can, we can sense itch, pain, tickle, um, just physical pressure, are, are those all really the same sense? And then we can sense all these things that are going on inside of us. We have a headache and a stomach ache and we're hungry and we're grouchy or whatever it is, you know, we're, um, we're tired. We all lump that into this big thing called sense of touch, but if you think about it, those are all very different, different things. Where does that sense come from? And then we have this sense of balance, 
we know if we close our eyes, we know if we're falling, right? Because there's this thing in our, in our ear that is built in. That's, you know, that's literally a sixth sense, and there's others. So I think there, there may be perceptive abilities that we have that we don't know about yet. Yes. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, okay, as we talk about all these things that we all, that, are, that we're all aware of, whether we're seeing it or tasting it or, or whatever, we know from the New Testament, you know, there were blind people there and Christ interacted with them. And uh, so that all, although we all have Different perceptions. We don't. We don't know what our what how my perception is different from yours. We don't know that. Right. But Christ, I give him credit for knowing, and uh, and 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 in spite of that, in spite of the fact that your perception may be different from mine, uh, he still holds us responsible for our own perception. That's right. That's right. Yeah, because our perception is not exactly what the world really looks like, but it is enough to know that there is a real world out there and gives us the ability to interact with it and makes us responsible for how we treat especially other people. Any other questions? Mark. So it seems like some of the themes you were talking about, one would be the extravagance of God and how much he loves us and how much more than evolution would ever provide that he's gifted us and also I think another point you've been talking about is us being more loving and caring about other people that we don't quite get along with or we don't quite understand how they see the world. Patience. Could you talk a little bit more on that? Yeah, so Mark you've got someone who's related to you that you've told me about which is who seems from the way you describe that person would be a very, very difficult person to relate to. And I thought a lot about the stories you told me about, about that person in putting this talk together. It seems to me that person probably has perceptive abilities and reasoning abilities that aren't just different than the way most of us are different, but is like radically different. So, you know, I don't want to say who that person is unless you, want, you wanted to, but the question would be, how do we love that person? They're the kind of people that you, you hear stories, and my first reaction is, I just want to judge that person. It's just much easier to say, well, they don't care, or they're kind of stupid, or they're just, they're just willful, or they're, they're sinful, or whatever, right? That's easy to do, and then I feel better. But, I, don't, I can't do that, I don't wanna do that. I wanna like, wow, what, what does their sound and light show look like? How is it so different from mine that that person comes to entirely different conclusions than I would in the same circumstance? How, in other words, how do you love that person and not judge them? It's hard, it's, a, it's really hard work, but as Christians, that's what we're called to do. Does that answer your question? Yes, it's um, us being more loving, more uh, willing to to look at things maybe from a different point of view that, yeah. than that what we have, and the ability to put ourselves in their shoes. And God made that person the way they are. Okay, well then, if she, if God's not going to judge them, who am I to judge them? But it's a lot of work. It's a lot. Takes a lot more effort. You've got to really. You've got to have the Lord right there in your head all the time. <laughs> um, so I, I remember you you posed maybe it was a rhetorical question, but you know it was why why did God made a, make us all humans so different from each other? And I was reminded of the passage about the the different parts of the body, right? Of the body of Christ. Oh yeah. You know, it was a foot. And the foot can't say to the ear or whatever, you know, what are you doing? You're just an ear. Because the foot has its own job. And right. that reminded me of that. But um, that also made me think of the angels. Do you think they also perceive differently? Um, and so he, he clearly made some creatures, the angelic beings, and I'm betting you they don't have cones in their eyes. They don't even have eyes that function biologically like us. They might see all 
all of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum right. or something. Right. Um, but clearly, they had disagreements too. Um, I don't know. Any thoughts on that? No. <laughs> um, I guess I had. <laughs> well, I think. Am I more different than other people? Than I have two dog. We have two dogs. Then one of my dogs is from my other dog. I think it's the further down we get in the animal kingdom, probably the less difference there is. We're created in God's image. We're his crowning achievement. There's probably more variety in us than in any other beings. But this, it's really conjecture. I mean, the Bible does talk about the angelic realm and, and angels making decisions and doing things and having, having a will. But do they, I would guess that because they're not embodied primarily, they don't, they are not going to have the perceptual differences that we do. They may have the experiential differences that we have, but how do you, how do you, how, how do you say, what do you say about a, a being that's entirely spiritual that's not enfleshed? I don't, I don't, it's a great question and we can talk about it the next time we get a beer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not good with questions, and I'm not good with microphones. <laughs> but um, I, really I really appreciate your teaching. Thank so you. I know that what, what I concluded, too, with what you were saying is love is more important than having a total understanding of someone. Because um, we, we, we don't always, we can't ever totally understand a person and what they've gone through. And we have recently helped in a special needs class. And um, these special needs kids could not understand or relate to a brainiac. And right. yet they had the ability to love on people. They looked around the room and they saw needs of their fellow uh, students. And they said, so-and-so needs to have a chair because they can't get out of their wheelchair. Somebody needs to, so they were, they were loving on each other. So to me, the mo more important than totally understanding and perceiving what somebody has gone through, which we never could, is to love on them. That's what God calls us to do, Jesus called us to do, to love him with all our hearts, mind, and soul, and to love others. It's not totally to understand them. Yeah. So a special needs person can be more ob obedient to Christ <laughs> yes. than we are. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mike? Oh. Okay. Any yeah, more well, questions? <clears throat> one, one question. Anything online? Sorry? No, I didn't see any. I saw statements, but not questions. Okay. Um, in the light of what we know about the unreliability of our perception, as you were saying, what does that say about the ethical, about the ethics of Moses' command to have two or three witnesses in a criminal case? Well, I think... Now we're talking civic. Yeah. I've got a couple answers to that. I think if, if the world was honest and if we all perceived things the same way, it would only take one witness, wouldn't it? Because that person would have seen, would have told the truth and seen things for what they really are. But it takes two or three witnesses or sometimes 20 or 30 witnesses because we all see things very differently, especially in a crisis situation. If there's a fire or an accident or a bomb goes off and you interview the people that were right there, some of the very specific things that they relate are very different than the other specific thing, than the things that other, the specific things that other people relate. So there really is an outside world out there. This bottle of water is real. It's not a figment of my imagination. Each one of you may perceive it differently and may think about it differently, but it's, it's, it's really there. And I just think, I think it takes several people to come close to telling the truth about an event because of the way our brain, our brain is built. But it doesn't mean we can't know the truth. You know, just be, it's, like, it's like just because there seem to be discrepancies, say, in the gospel telling of the number of women that were at the at the, at the empty tomb, people will say, oh, the Bible's unreliable. See, those numbers are different and the names are different. Well, just, 
read any newspaper, you know, find four newspaper accounts of the same thing that happened written by four different people and there's going to be discrepancies in there. But it doesn't mean that the event didn't happen, right? It just means that people can perceive it differently. Or even the person they were, the emphasis was on a certain person. Though. That's right, that's right. I notice, I, I notice, I, I look at the map rather than, you know, something else. Somebody else sees something else. Everybody's going to be drawn. Their visual attention is going to be on something different. Yeah, Ross, it's just like that, uh, the, um, I, I don't know if it's a test or a game, but you line up people in a row and uh -huh. you start you start a statement here, by the time it gets to the end, it's a different, right. <laughs> might Tele be completely different game. sometimes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, she's saying, well, you say one thing and say it to the next person and they say it to the next and by the time you get five or six people away, it's often completely different than, because we hear different things, we remember different things. That's another entire thing that I didn't touch on is memory. You know, we can, all, we can all experience the same thing, and not only are we going to pay attention to different parts of it, but when we recall it, we're going to recall it differently. I was going to ask about that one, but I forgot. <laughs> so, and we're out of time. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Close this.